Ladies and gentlemen, let's read Gamer Telecom video. Let us discuss Microsoft's newest API. That would be 11.3. Now, this is also an article on redgamingtech.com if you want a lot more information, including some diagrams and technical slides, you can go ahead and check the article. I will, however, be going over pretty much all of this stuff anyway in this video, but I give further examples and also provide additional links in the, in the actual article. It just makes it a lot easier. So anyway... Back in GDC 2014, Microsoft formally unveiled DirectX 12, um, which of course we knew was going to have quite a lot of radical changes. We knew that it was going to take a rather Mansell-like approach, or very console-like approach if you prefer, and was going to provide a lot more control for, say, over GPU, You're going to allow low-level functions, that type of thing, vast improvements over multi-threading, and a variety of other functions as well. Um, but we knew that some functions of DX12 um, and some of the improved feature set had actually already made itself into the Xbox One's API. But quite a bit of what they were doing was shrouded in mystery. They have an official development blog, but even that's not routinely updated. Um, and trying to contact them asking them about future updates is pretty much just pointless. So, anyway, now, um, the Maxwell architecture has been officially unveiled. We've, we actually know a lot more about DX 11.3. But you may ask, why is it an 11.3? Why do we need this, like, interim step? I have gone into this a lot more in depth in the article, but the basic bottom line is that not all developers require um, low-level access to the GPU. So, it actually requires more work for games developers. Therefore, let's say you're like a f five people in your game's um, developer's studio. Let's say there's five people working on the game, including yourself. Uh, that could be, for example, two visual artists, a couple of programmers, and let's say a designer. And They've probably got multiple roles anyway, which is generally speaking how it works in smaller smaller teams, there's a very good chance that you just don't either have the technical skills required for low-level access programming, you don't require it, it might be your game is not visually impressive enough, or it's just not something you have the time to do. You know, you can't afford to outsource to other programmers, you can't afford to outsource to like another dozen programmers to help you create all this stuff, and yes, DX12 will, for the most part, feature quite heavily in, say, Unreal Engine 4. So you have got that pre-baked in ability, but not everyone wants to pay for the licensing or can or wants to use Unreal uh, Engine 4. Maybe they want to create their own engine, or maybe the Unreal Engine doesn't really do exactly what they need, which is admittedly unlikely since it's so diverse, but still, or it could just be that they've already created their own look or aesthetics, and even if they are using UE4, the fact of the matter is it still requires a hell of a lot more testing and it's a lot easier to break something using DX12. So that also brings us to the whole feature level situation. You might have heard of feature level already. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. In essence, it allows users of multiple GPUs um, to be able to run at the same kind of code path. It just basically allows the developers to not have to rewrite everything. Um, assuming the user has a different GPU. For example, one user might have, say, um, a DX9, another might have, say, DX10, another might have DX11, and therefore they don't have to rewrite all the code base from the scratch, which is not ideal. Instead, they can simply enable or disable things, and it's all part of the um, abstraction there, if you will, of DirectX. Now, there are new features for DX11.3. Um, as well as DX12. Now there are features in DX12 which most likely won't make it into DX11.3 as far as I'm reading. Um, and I've gone ahead and linked DX11, uh, sorry, DX12 features specifically in the article. So in those you've got certain things that Microsoft have already unveiled and we've seen which are going to be specifically because of low level access and so on so they can do that. But even 11.3 will bring in several new features which are going to be pretty key 
quite a few of them are actually mostly around voxels um, and basically improved efficiency. So the first one um, we're going to discuss, and this is in no real order, Microsoft haven't said this is the most important one, but they probably have, but hey, I've just put them in any old order, is typed UAV load. So UAV load um, is unordered access view. Now these are a special type of buffers which allow you to read such write from multiple threads without causing um, memory issues. So in other words, there won't be any memory conflicts. It's similar-ish in principle to a pixel shader, but it's extremely different in that with a pixel shader you can only write from one location per render target. With this, you're basically writing or reading, depending on obviously the operation, from multiple threads simultaneously. The difference with typed UAV loads is it goes ahead and tries to attempt to address an issue um, such as restrictions that are currently already in DirectX. So it's basically an extension and improvement over what's currently already there. Next up we have conservative rasterization. This one is all about accuracy bugger speed. It tests whether a polygon covers part of a pixel. Generally speaking what happens is that there's a quick test performed by the game's engine to see if a center of a pixel is what's known as bounded by the lines of a polygon. Conservative rasterization is a lot more expensive because instead of checking the center it checks each of the corners of the pixel. So what if for example the polygon doesn't quite meet the center of a pixel the traditional technique would miss it whereas this one would catch it regardless because as long as it's within any of those corners in other words as long as it's touching at all it's going to find it. This is going to be useful in a variety of different areas particularly as now we're pushing towards tiling. So yes it's going to be more expensive in terms of compute power but could be really handy in terms of memory conservation and so on. The other major boon, of course, would be collision detection, which is something that game engines have been struggling with for some time. Let's be totally and utterly honest, there's nothing more immersion breaking than seeing a little bit of a thumb or a leg or something popping out through a door before you even enter the bloody door. It's really bad, and early 3D engines were really, really awful of that. And we're still not quite perfect, but we're getting better. Next up, we have volume tiled resources. So, you might already have heard two words there which have immediately sparked or kindled your interest tiled resources. Tiled resources, some would call it mega texturing, it's known in med mega texturing and say uh, Rage, John Carmack usually calls it mega texturing, it's known that I believe in OpenGL and so on. But it's pretty much um, going to be extremely powerful. For example, one of the images that Microsoft have provided shows they've got a texture which is um, 1200 by 600 by 632 bit BPP, bits per pixel, and that's weighing in at about 1.6 gigs. Now they've got another text, they've got another one which is a tiled texture 3D which is 32, 32 um, by 16 by 32 BPP. Um, once again, this image is in the article, but anyway, um, times 2,500 non-empty volume tiles, and that weighs in to be 156 MB. So, that's quite a size difference. The key word, however, is volume. The fact that it's basically volume is pushing it to the third dimension, and it's going to be primarily aimed at volumetric pixels, or voxels if you prefer. And the idea is simple, it's yet another technique which is focused on efficiency and improvements from that. Um, basically it's going to look at information that these tiles contain, and if it says, oh gee, this isn't really that useful, it's not going to be visible in the scene, or whatever. Um, it basically won't be allocated. And this improves memory bandwidth because, well, it doesn't have to be sent anywhere. And it also increase, it improves the amount of memory it's taking up because, well, it's not taking up memory. So in other words, it's not being allocated in the first bloody place. The next one we're going to discuss is rasterizer 
ordered views. Once again, the phrase rasterizer order views gives you a hint of maybe what this does. It basically controls the it allows developer controls over which order elements are actually created in. Um, so this basically means that elements of the game are drawn in the correct order and there are going to be fewer errors. This obviously fits in very well with UAV since they are just going to be finished in what or created in whatever order they're finished first. Now currently there or there are already safety measures in place. For example, it could already be occluded, for example, but it's better to have this level of control, quite frankly speaking, for the sake of efficiency. Um so yeah, it's once again another issue of control that the developers have afforded and more importantly it provides yet another speed boost. Now we have um, ordered interdependent transparency. This actually goes really well with uh, rasterized uh, ordered views. So if you're trying to think of a, a visual example of this, if you've ever used any image editing application for say blending, so in other words you're blending two images together, you'll have the basic premise here. Another way to think of this is to make sure that no matter which order an image is created in or visual elements are created in, you're going to get the desired result. So what you don't want for example, and this is a very stupid example, a very simple example, not a stupid one, but a very simple example is, you, let's say you're creating something and then you've got like a blue light and you've got another one which is a yellow light you don't want that because you created it in a different order or whatever um, and then you've got something else maybe that's appeared on the scene you don't want that to suddenly cast like red shadows that would be really silly you need to make sure basically think of it this way if you pour blue paint into a pot and then add yellow it should have the same result as if you put yellow and then blue so and this is just, a, once again, yet another control method you've, they've got to make sure that blending all happens quite well. It's even more important to remember that there has already been a feature in, implemented in DX11 for quite some time. Uh, but the problem with it... <laughs> you, uh, OT, OIT, as it's known, is extremely hungry for performance. So it's great for, say, computer-aided design, particularly if you've got like a very high-end GPU. It can be good for, say, 3D rendering work, for, say, 3DS Max, Maya, that type of thing. But if you're a developer and you're aiming for a certain level of performance, it's not ideal because, well, it hurts the performance quite significantly. From what I'm hearing, developers are quite excited regarding its possibilities for say anti-aliasing. Now you might know post-process AA in particular this could be useful possibly for that um, because obviously at the end of the day it's, a lot of this stuff is blended anyway so it could be helpful but obviously we'll just have to see how it's really implemented. Once again just because a tool is there it doesn't necessarily mean that developers are going to utilize it well at the start. So as I was saying, there are already DX12 features which are not going to be implemented in this. Um, as I said, I've added a link to that in the video, to, in, in the article description. And they are making it abundantly clear that, hey, we are going to be pushing both low and high level API access for the reasons that I've already mentioned above. So this is going to be a situation that certainly some developers are going to be gravitating towards DX12 because they need that extra performance. Um, but if it's a console port, if you look at a lot of games on Steam, to be honest, the requirements are kind of... Uh, they're low, um, especially indie developers, so you just don't need it. But for the bleeding edge high end games, yes, it's going to be uh, it's going to be very helpful to have it, and it is going to mean that games are going to run better. I mean, when I was doing say mantle testing um, on the R9 280, for example, exactly the same. Everything else, all I did was flip a switch to enable mantle, and there was an absolute ridiculous performance boost just by enabling mantle, which is a low level API. So 
Obviously, it does require developers to put that extra bit of time in to develop the code paths which are required and to do the testing and to make sure that not not everything falls over. You know, you don't want uh, the wheels to come off halfway down the, the, the hill, so to speak. But it is looking to be extremely promising, and I do approve of Microsoft's um, decision here. I, I feel it was the best one, really, they could have made. And to be honest with you, the realistic answer is it's actually the only answer well the only thing they could have made it was the only decision that made logical sense because you don't want the x11 to be lagging behind so much because then it somewhat forces developers if they want to go a certain route to well do i leave these visual effects out or do I just go ahead to try use DX11, uh, sorry, DX12 when, you know, I don't really have the time or whatever. And that and that's not a good situation either. You don't want to force developers to go ahead and do something. Remember, even um, even the Xbox One does have high-level uh, access on its GPU. And there are extensions which allow you to go low-level. Low, low and I think that's probably the best option. Because, let's face it, not all the games on the Xbox One need low level access it's just pretty simple anyway guys hopefully you've enjoyed the video and found it somewhat informative i'll see you soon take care and bye for now